Welcome to architectural series titled Architects Talk or Conversations with Architects. Today we have a very distinguished guest, Sir David Chipperfield. Welcome to Turkey and welcome to this series. As far as I understand, you are one of the most admired foreign architect in Turkey, in the territory of Turkey. <laughs> you are representing a quite unique, different place with, within contemporary British architecture uh, and within British architects, compared with Foster, Rogers, and even Alshap, maybe. For example, you are representing a more conceptual sense of architecture, freed from any stylistic pre-engagement, and uh, more contextual in that sense. How do you locate yourself within the British architecture and within the contemporary scene? Um, well, I studied. <coughs> I studied in. I studied at the Kingston School of Art and in the Architectural Association. And then I worked for Richard Rogers and for Norman Foster, mm -hmm. who I uh, have great admiration for. And then I started my own practice. And my first three buildings were in Japan. And most, I would say, 90% of my architecture has been outside of England mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, in the last 30 years. So More than 40 countries. Possibly. <laughs> it says when I, when I look at your CV. <laughs> uh, it feels like it. Um, so although my background is English and I, was, I am English and I, my formation is clearly from there, um, my professional experience is, is quite international. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And therefore I would say that I don't, I don't necessarily position myself consciously in relation to the British architectural scene. Um, in some ways, I, I disengaged from the British architectural scene because in the 80s, this was a, a difficult commercial time mm -hmm. and even a difficult cultural time, you know, with Margaret Thatcher really making a big um, uh, and radical cut into, um, into culture and the role of, of um, artists and, and uh, creative industries, you know, it was... So it was a sort of negative period in a way. And... Um, but also it was promoted as if it is a kind of a emerging new architecture, the, everything that comes with the Prince Charles and the Crea, etc., the postmodern discussions. Well, there was certainly... There was. I mean, that was a bit earlier. Yes, it's true. The late 70s, early 80s, um, there was this strange moment. So in, in, in England, there was this coincidence between, uh, in a way, a, a sort of um, a political, very strong political condition under Thatcher, an economically difficult moment. And then also, one would have to say in a way that the final death of modernism mm -hmm. announced by this, at the time, quite interesting idea of looking at history again, what became called postmodernism. Mm -hmm. um, but this was an interesting moment because there was a sort of, yes, a, a sort of collapse of confidence mm -hmm. in, in everything, mm -hmm. but a new confidence in, in, uh, in history. And so, the architectural heroes of Le Corbusier and Alto and Mies and you know this, the standard um, uh, formula that we were we were educated on became expanded. You know the the menu of uh, legitimate uh, uh, architects to consider was was considerably expanded into Lutyens and and um, Leverance and all sorts of other. So all of a sudden there was a new energy uh, coming at this moment in terms of uh, architectural style and form 
a discussion about the city, a discussion about history. Mm -hmm. That's true. That was a very interesting moment. But to return to your question, in a way, you know, where I sit within the English condition, it was, has been, in, professionally, I've been quite released from that. But absolutely, the, that, that uh, moment, I would say, when I was just finishing my studies, uh, or in the period I was finishing my studies, when I was studying, um, this uh, very charged moment where where I wouldn't, I wouldn't say modernism died at that moment. It had been dying for quite a long time. But I think finally uh, there was really uh, uh, a sort of you know, the, last, the last breath of... And I think that was, a very, that was a very interesting time. And especially there wasn't much work. So people were, were talking a lot, drawing a lot. You talk about uh, Leon Creer. So, you know, there was... A lot of there was much more theory, much more discussion. The Anglo-Saxon world, I mean, certainly in England for the last 15 years, is, there's been a lot of work, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and conversely, not much theory, and not much discussion, and not much thought. Um, so one, one can easily see that by looking at AD magazine, for example. I mean, if you compare the today's significance of AD. Uh, in contemporary period with 80s, there's a significant difference, I think, I mean, in terms of leading the uh, mainstream architectural discussion in 80s. Yeah. Well, there's another issue about the, 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 um, the autobiography of particular publications and at what moment, you know. But it represents the B British power on media, I think. So that, that was why... Less it now, it did then, yeah. yes. I think it was a really important magazine under Monica Pigeon. Ken mm -hmm. Frampton worked there, mm -hmm. and then Haig Beck took it over. Um, it, it was the, the more independent magazine at the time. Mm -hmm. I think you can also say that, if I'm allowed to say it, I think magazines are less important now. Where we That's have, true, in general. We have so much more access mm -hmm. to other things. You've got to think, in those days, there just wasn't much going on. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we had to look for things. I mean, that's, that's been the experience of my lifetime, in a way. You know, I, I grew up, I was born 1953. You know, I remember when we had one television channel, <laughs> black and white, <laughs> and... At seven o'clock, there was n for children. There was nothing to look after That's at eight o'clock. You know, you you just turned it off. Now, so you know, we had to look for things. We had to we had to find things. Now, there's, you know, everything is available. That's true. Everything you can buy. Everything you can. So, does it, does it apparently mean a, a sense of plurality or richness? I mean, such an availability. Well. Yeah, and it, you can't you can't close, you know, <laughs> you can't close Pandora's box. That's true. But certainly, I would say, the fact um, that one of the things that I talk about a lot, and I will talk about tonight, is about uh, the meaning of things, and I think in this new plurality things mean less. That's, you know. yeah. Now, it may be because I'm older. No, no, that was the thing uh, I was trying to underline as I well. I think yeah. that when everything is available, you know, nothing tastes quite so good anymore. Uh, yes. You know, when you're hungry, food tastes really good. You know, when, when you don't have so much availability of ideas, ideas mean a lot. When, when, when images are everywhere, maybe images don't mean so much. You know, I mean, now everybody has Instagram and everybody, no one. So I think this is a crisis for our, for our time. And, you know, certainly for my children's time, which is, is somehow an ability to sort of self-edit, to give meaning mm -hmm. to things, to, to through, through one's own rigor and discipline and... Um, uh, processes 
to find meaning in things because um, that uh, this excess and availability doesn't guarantee it. In fact, you could argue that it nearly is the opposite. And, and certainly, I think this is the big problem for our cities and for architecture. Is such a critical distance to such an artificial plurality, uh, can it be an alternative ground to move on? For example, we are talking about the death of modernism, uh, but on the other hand, we all know that there is a sustainable form of modern uh, movement and architecture, like Alvaro Siza and Luigi Snozzi and whatever comes with the other practices, more local and more contextual, uh, which which doesn't, uh, uh, which are not reductionist in, in in terms of form production or something like that. So. As far as I understand, uh, your architecture can be a kind of a model uh, which can be associated with anything comes with Siza or Snuzi in a different way. Well, you've mentioned sort of people who are who have influenced me and yeah, I, I know. remain heroes to me, um, and certainly I believe that as an architect you are looking to embed ideas in a contextual way and that doesn't only mean uh, in a historical way or in a geographical way it can be a sociological way I mean, but I think it goes back to the same question that I think one is looking for meaning in one's mm -hmm. work. I think the bigger picture is not about architectural form or style is to do with the role of architecture and what architecture is, what the capacity of architecture is. And the death of modernism wasn't just a death of architecture which looked like modern. modern. It was the death of the ambitions mm -hmm. of architecture. Ideology, the mm -hmm. ideologies and the and the re rhetoric of of a profession that imagine that it may be able to shape society, mm -hmm. and by we, the time we got to the sixties and seventies, I think there was a sense that architecture cannot shape mm -hmm. independently. Mm -hmm. This is not the fa it's not the fault of an architecture. It's not the fault of architects. It's not even the fault of planners. It's it's the change in society mm -hmm. from from a society that has structures and authorities that um, have some notion of controlling to a free market system, mm -hmm. and uh, we now certainly in England we have a completely free market condition where architecture and design is only a value is only valued if it can increase value itself that's true yeah so architecture has become uh, a tool of leverage mm -hmm. we, we are in a we are you know everything we do now society is about leveraging money Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, we're trying to to take water, put it in a bottle, and sell it for more, mm -hmm. and hopefully uh, find uh, optimize the difference between the raw material and the and the, the final product. And it's a perfectly legitimate, and it has always been the case. That's how we trade. That's how we've always traded. But now, with that trading, is becoming through um, through a sort of uncontrolled consumerism, it's becoming somehow uh, you know contagious. So but design, for, for instance, design, mm -hmm. you know, we would say after the war, a furniture designer or, or an industrial designer is trying to make the cheapest things at the highest quality. 
Now design easy is to reproduce, to, hmm? easy to repro reproduce. Yes, the best quality, the most efficient manufacture, the most economic in terms of material use. And now designers are engaged in trying to optimize value. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So the idea is to make the most expensive table, not the cheapest table. The market's not interested in cheap tables. But uh, on the other hand, I mean, that uh, market price is not only validated with the material quality, but a kind of an identity. That's what I'm which saying. Is, yeah, that's, that's which is added to that. And in that sense, a leverage. Yeah, it's a leverage. But in that sense, doesn't it give uh, an architect an extra opportunity or possibility to experiment Absolutely. new things? In, in, and in areas where yeah. leverage is valuable. Hmm. But if you're, if, you're designing a, if you're designing apartments for hospital workers, mm -hmm. where is the leverage? What, what does it mean? <laughs> where is the leverage? <laughs> That's true. You can, so you only design apartments for rich people. Uh -huh. Because in London, if Norman Foster designs an apartment, uh, housing, you know, rich, rich apartments, maybe that adds 30% mm -hmm. to the value. That's true. Maybe by him doing it, he can convince uh, the planners to give 20% more area. Mm -hmm. So you can use Norman Foster to leverage. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But no one designing apartments for uh, hospital workers is going to be interested in leveraging the value because the nurse does not pay higher rental because Norman Foster designed it. So that means all of a sudden you start to get a difference between what, what architects can work on or are encouraged to work on or have the freedom or have the benefit of a leverage system. Museums, railway stations, rich apartments, you know, these types of things. But schools, no. Libraries, you know, housing. No. So all of a sudden, architecture becomes, it leaves behind the, the thing it normally did. We used to make cities. We used to mm -hmm, be mm -hmm. part of, of making society. Not just piece of society, not just moments where you can uh, explain and give value. And on the other hand, what kind of a value are we talking about? I mean, is it the value of the object artificially associated in the markets by the name of money. the architect? We're talking about money. Yeah, the, the market There's value. There's only one value. Yeah. Uh, because, I mean, if, if something if, is successful, it's successful because it makes more money. Yeah, if you go back to, uh, I mean, s discussions of 60s, 70s, I mean, the sustainability was a real uh, value. And uh, we were talking about the ecological cities and yeah. uh, the space quality, uh, sustainability in terms of culture and life and space qualities. Uh, relations between people, the social interaction, uh, all these we values. We have to find ways by which these issues are, 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 are given voice again. But mm -hmm. at the moment, it's very difficult. To Does architecture have any power to do that? As it was believed earlier. Of course. <laughs> architecture does. Does the profession of architects mm -hmm. have this power? Willing to do that? Well, I think they're willing, but you know, as you know, architects can't just say, "Okay, you know what? Uh, you know, let's go and build a nice street." Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, architects can't do anything independently. Architects are—we are at the service mm -hmm. of society. So now we we can offer resistance and. You know, there is a great uh, responsibility of us as architects to be the voice of resistance mm -hmm. as well as the voice of complicity. Mm -hmm. But in our success mediated, you know, age, complicity is much more powerful than, um, you know, uh, Resistance. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, if you resist something, you don't get much work. That's if you true. comply, you get work. That's true. If you don't get much work, you don't have much voice. If you have a lot of work, you have voice. So, 
So the, the, the voice of resistance is, is a difficult one now. There's not a huge respect mm -hmm. for, for an architect who says, I will only do this work, I won't do that work. So, you know, there's no, there are no radical architects anymore. I mean, no one can tell me that... Or, or radicalism is understood in a different way. I mean, it's how much different forms that you are creating and that's not radical. how you are forcing the technology. You're talking about certain people do funny shapes. Yeah, that's true. And funnier shapes than others. <laughs> so that's not, I mean, is Geary radical? No, I think, I think he's amazingly inventive, a sort of genius in a way. I would actually have to say, I think Geary is a sort of genius. Um, he's invented, you know, uh, a sort of architectural language. Mm -hmm. And uh, he's managed to, to find himself the space and the position to do exceptionally original things. Is this radical? I'm not sure it's radical. But is it open to uh, be repeated? And is, is, it, is it a kind of a really language or is it, I mean... I don't know, but what I'm trying to say is that I don't know how much it changes anything. That's true. Yeah. Does it really change much? In that sense, I don't think it's radical. So, but on the other hand, I'm not sure that architecture is ever very radical. Mm. Because if you're building a museum for $120 million, no one's radical. I mean, it's not, you can't be radical with $120 million. It's, That's true. There's too much <laughs> investment. There's too much, no one is going to give a risk. So this idea that we can be safe in our beds because certain architects are doing really interesting work. I think they are, but it's not really dealing with the issues at hand. You know, our cities get uglier and uglier. That's our, true. Our built environment gets worse and worse. And we get some very nice buildings somewhere. That, that's what I used to say, actually. I mean, two nice buildings doesn't automatically make a nice city mm -mm. when they come together. So it's, uh, city is an, another issue uh, to be considered. No, I would say that, that the quality of singular buildings over the last 30 years is really high. Mm -hmm. You know, if I think when I was a student, mm -hmm. I mean, Pompidou Center was the great yeah, thing. And I, I personally still think the Pompidou Center is is generally a radical building. Mm -hmm. I think it was the last great radical building in, in Western architecture, because um, it really dealt and undermined mm -hmm. issues in a profound manner. But, um, you know, in those days, there was one or two new buildings a year that were sort of interesting. Now there's hundreds, I mean, there's some really good singular buildings. I mean, some really good architects in every country, uh, you know, the, the, the sort of skill level, I That's think, true, but the, is much higher. The, the defin when definition of radicalism and being interesting is reduced to uh, difference of form, it is very easy to find lots of buildings. But it's not the same manner what comes with the Pompidou maybe. No, uh, no I think we've given up bigger ambitions mm -hmm. and we've we've now also don't forget we're a profession so in our profession now it's very important that you you um, make your biography quite quickly you 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 make a sort of identifiable That's language <laughs> you have a monograph of your work as you know and you become a, you become a discernible and identifiable um, choice but on the other hand, when I look at your buildings, I mean, you are mostly uh, dealing with museums, public buildings. I mean, not, for example, housing for the poor or something like that. So is, is it a kind of, a, again, a, an isolated position? Does it define an isolated position? Not on the negative sense, but either positive or negative sense, an isolated existence in architectural scene. Of course. I mean, we are, we, are, we are limited by the opportunities we have, uh, like everybody is. 
um, so one one is struggling sometimes to find relevance mm -hmm. in what you do. Museums are always a little bit easy in a way because somehow you feel like this is always uh, a sort of collective moment. Mm -hmm. I mean, the museum, however skeptical or cynical you are about the, the museum culture, it's difficult not to admit that in a way it must be for the common good in some way. Mm -hmm. And therefore, mm -hmm. you can operate mm -hmm. under that umbrella of feeling that you're reasonably legitimated in, uh, in social purpose by making museums. I don't think you're serving a social purpose maybe as profoundly important as you, if you were doing really good housing or building good cities, but uh, partly. Um, but I think the other thing is that when we are working, we do try to, to expand our responsibility beyond the task, the, the commercial task. Mm -hmm. And I think this is all an architect can do. You can't expect an architect to operate outside of, you know, a commercial process. But what you can do is expect the architect to engage wider issues. You are referring to an interconnected architectural culture, I mean, with reference to Venice Biennale, where you were the creator. It was a call for a kind of an as far as I understand, in, in interconnected architectural culture. Uh, what do you mean by that? I mean, is, is it something to overcome all these difficulties and problems, well, or is it a recall for a radical architecture? Uh, it was a reminder to my colleagues that at a moment where we have all been encouraged to identify what's different about ourselves and what identifies me, and therefore me as a product, from another one, that, that, you know, in the market sense. So, um, in the sense that we are, we have all been um, guilty of of trying to uh, develop our own autobi autobiographies. Um, I was trying to remind everybody that while we all think that what we do is very different to what, our, what another one does, actually we're all rather united by a series of concerns mm -hmm. and that maybe we should focus more on those common concerns uh, and talk about those as opposed to using the Biennale as a sort of giant trade fair mm -hmm. where 50 architects are all showing you what they can do compared to the other one. Mm -hmm. So I said as a director of the Biennale at that particular moment, I wasn't interested in creating the platform for each architect to show how clever they were compared to the other one, to be in a sort of cleverness competition. Um, but instead, for us all to show how clever collectively we might mm -hmm. be as mm -hmm. a profession and talk about how we might contribute something more than shapes and uh, images, which I still believe we do. I still believe we have that capacity. So I wanted everybody in a way to put their gun down when they entered and uh, concentrate on talking about what is a profession we share mm -hmm. and what, we, what concerns we have and how we might contribute in a more collective manner. And Common Ground was a very convenient title to discuss mm -hmm, about mm -hmm. what, uh, what intellectually connects us, um, what connects us in our professional concerns. Um, and also, of course, it, it implies a physical condition of ground, and mm -hmm. therefore it touches on the other aspect I wanted to talk about, which was architecture not only as the object, but architecture as the ground in between objects, the common ground. I see. You are building uh, all over the world, I mean, different geographies. Uh, it is uh, uh, sometimes difficult, maybe, 
but on the other hand, it, it brings a kind of a, a, a freedom or a ground of plurality to refer many different contextual realities and cultural pluralities, etc. But on the other hand, you should have a chance, chance to observe what's happening all around the world. So when you uh, look at all these ge different geographies, what do you see, I mean, as a comparative analysis, for example, is there really a kind of a thing like East and West? Um, yes, but you can find some East in the West and you can find a lot of West in the East. Uh -huh. um, what do I learn by being in different places? Well, you, you learn that essentially everybody shares very similar problems. Uh -huh. um, there, there are no unique issues. I think, for instance, the way that we work with our cities now, you know, the, the problem of the contemporary the city is, is the same in London as it is in Shanghai. Yeah. But is, is it the same to build a museum in Marrakesh and in Berlin, for example? Of course not. Not from, not from a, not from a professional point of view, not from a climate point of view, not from a technical point of view. But the essential issues are the same, mm -hmm. I think, and I think that's what, that's what's important. That I, I think that we can overcomplicate technical things. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, we can somehow uh, disguise the most simple ideas with very complicated explanations. But in the end, um, we're all human you know, mm -hmm. and we all respond to rather similar things. Um, you know, and I think architecture at its most basic um, level can appeal to that. You know, I think we can find a sort of, uh, a, there is something, there is a commonality whether you're in Mexico mm -hmm. or in Shanghai or in Korea or in, in Istanbul. Um, despite conditions, there is still, um, there are still common desires, there are still intuitive and, and uh, human desires, you know, whatever we think, however individualized our society becomes, uh, and certainly in the West it's becoming extremely individualized, it's all about you know, luxury has become, for instance, a sort of the protection, the mm. pampering of the individual. Um, and it's, it's more and more to do with isolation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But actually, everybody still wants to go to a restaurant and sit and eat meals with other people without ever talking to them. But <laughs> everybody still, you know, and even people that buy very expensive boats, they all go and park them together in the same place, you know. They, so there's, a, there's, there's an undeniable desire for human beings to be, um, to participate in some idea of the collective. Mm -hmm. This is, optimistically, I think, is, doesn't change. Mm -hmm. you know, people sit in a coffee shop and read a book. Why? <laughs> Why don't you read it at home? Because you want to be, you know. It's an alternative way of participating. Participating, maybe, yes. And, you know, as. When you don't have other tools of participation, when it is shrinked. Yeah, absolutely. And, yeah, it's reduced to that so, kind of participation. And as, as we, as society, seems to be less and less capable in physical terms of creating spaces of participation and moments of participation. And when so much of that has been replaced by either media or consumerism, mm -hmm. so we only go together when we're shopping or eating, which is a slightly mm -hmm. sad condition, then I do think that um, architects have to work quite hard to work within 
a growing private sector because, to be honest, the public sector is sort of disappearing. Mm -hmm. you know, the notion of there being a public sector has nearly gone. Yeah, because what's happening is that the public sector is being delivered by the private sector. That's true, yeah. So, therefore, we have to work hard with our clients to try and seduce the private sector into being more publicly spirited. Well, I think that's very important. Uh, what about the clients in Turkey? I mean, you are now realizing a project in Bosphorus, uh, an ongoing restoration hmm. plus a pavilion. pavilion. Hmm. Hmm. Uh, how is it going? Okay, slowly. <laughs> slowly. <laughs> no, but it's a complicated project. But I have to say, I think um, the restoration part, we're restoring the two, these two palaces, mm, two plus, yeah. which were in a terrible condition. One was, one was burnt with a fire uh -huh. and uh, lost an enormous amount of the material, and the other had been already um, destroyed and rebuilt in concrete. And, and so we're putting these two back, um, and we're putting them back super carefully and very precisely in a very scientific manner. And I think this will be a very high level of reconstruction. Um, and we are fortunate to have a client that supported us in that. Mm -hmm. I think that's a really, uh, that's a very good aspect of the project. Um, and we, we see, I mean, it's, it's, it's in progress and, yeah. and we're very confident about those parts. And uh, the new pavilion is in construction, and hopefully we can get the quality in there. We can, we, we, we want. But we are waiting, know. waiting to see it. We are very excited to see it. You, you I mean, th there is something I always wonder. I mean, you are working like a very boutique office. When I look at the projects and the end products. Uh, you, you are working like Alvaras is a Luigi Snozzi. But on the other hand, when I look at your practice, it's a real international firm having branches in different cities, hmm. hundreds of people maybe involved. Uh, so how these two things are coming together? It's uh, not easy, I think. No, but that's the idea. The idea is that we, we, we want to be a, a viable commercial practice, mm -hmm. you know, that is not uh, a studio with 15 people, but we are a practice of 250 people. Mm -hmm. um, and because of that scale, it means that we can do more than one thing. We can, we can maybe have an influence and have a, have a reach which you couldn't have as a studio. On the other hand, we believe that you should deliver um, at the highest quality. So that, that that ambition to work within, to be, you know, relevant, to be a relevant practice, not, not a sort of exclusive and artificial practice, but a, a relevant practice, shouldn't come at the cost of quality. So mm -hmm. um, we want to prove that it's possible to operate as it were, in the market, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, but at the same time to insist on, on standards and ideas and engagement. You know, it's not just building quality. I mean, you can do that. I mean, it, you just have to persuade your client just to spend a bit more money. Mm -hmm, that's, mm -hmm. that's, I wouldn't say that's easy, but that's more tangible. But to get clients to, do, I, to follow ideas, mm -hmm which are not necessarily the most obvious or, or the most simple or the most straightforward. That's more difficult. One last question. Uh, how do you see the... Con I mean, do you have any idea about the contemporary Turkish architecture, uh, Turkish architects, or at least in Istanbul, you, no. you, you have an idea about what is newly built and how it looks like? No, but I think the difficulty for Istanbul, as many cities, um, uh, is, is not one of architecture, mm -hmm. simply. I think it's one of...
protection, mm. uh, protection and development. And this is, I think, the crisis of all contemporary cities, and especially those cities which have more to protect or more to lose, um, is how do you uh, develop and how do you accept investment and growth and all the things that come with that at the same time not lose mm -hmm. what mm -hmm. defines a city already. That's true. And this comes both in terms of hardware and software. So you can protect maybe certain buildings. I mean, first of all, we, we all know that we can protect monuments. It's not, it's not difficult to protect monuments. Yeah. I mean, no one's going to knock down. Everybody can foresee that, yeah. <laughs> okay. We have a consensus internationally that you don't destroy churches and mosques and these things and highest level buildings. However, the city is not made only from monuments, it's made from secondary and tertiary architecture. And this secondary architecture or even tertiary architecture sometimes can contribute an enormous amount to the quality of the city. So can you, can you protect those more vernacular architecture? especially in the center of the city where, you know, maybe you have three-story housing and everybody would like to come and build 20-story towers. Mm -hmm. That's one thing. The second thing, let's imagine you can, mm -hmm. because there's an increasing understanding that to take away very beautiful old buildings, even if they're in a poor condition, um, is less legitimate now than it was 20 years ago, let's say. Um, and uh, this, this happens at different speeds in different countries, depending on the view. This, the second aspect, which is slightly more difficult and uh, much more complex, is the software. Is how do you keep communities mm -hmm. in cities? How do you... So let's imagine you say, okay, these buildings are very beautiful. Let's keep them. Let's not build uh, new buildings there. But in order to, to restore those buildings, normally someone wants to increase their value. That mm -hmm. means moving those people that are living there away and turning them into shops. Or, or in that way, you, you, you have another type of problem. Especially in cities like Istanbul, where hundreds, thousands, millions of people are migrating from Anatolia to yeah. Istanbul. But also the, the quality of the city is, born, yeah. is still, you know, in a way, the problem for Istanbul is there's too much life in the city. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but this is a nice problem. Mm -hmm. And coming from a northern city, you know, where we don't have enough life, or the only life we have is consumer life. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So people come into the center to shop and eat, and then they go out again. We don't have people making screws and uh, selling rubber pieces for <laughs> pipes. <laughs> That's true, <yeah. laughs> <laughs> this, is a, this is a type of uh, urban uh, mixture. This is why we like cities. This is why we made cities. And in the north of Europe, we are destroying our cities because we're, we're putting anything that isn't high value. Keeping the buildings, but destroying the cities. You know I mean? Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's really interesting, yes. Would you like to add anything? Uh, no, I, I mean, I think this last point for me is, is uh, a theme, an expanding theme for, for society that we have to try and understand, uh, you know, I think we shouldn't be seduced by the idea that a few good architects making a few good buildings is what architecture is about. And we've a little bit um, moved our view of architecture onto this sort of star architect, the object, uh, and there's sufficient numbers of them, which are nice. Um, and in that process, we forget, you know, 99.999% of the world, the fit of our built world, mm -hmm. which um, is not being looked after in the same way. And I think this is our challenge is and especially as investment becomes a, des a necessary um, uh, you know, way of cities surviving, um, 
how do we how do we stop that exploitation get out of that vicious circle maybe at yeah. the same time. thank you very much for being with us for joining the series you're welcome Thanks. thank you <laughs>